You're listening to the Parent Pod Podcast by Jimboree Play and Music with Adonica Shaw, a weekly conversation about early childhood development topics for parents with children ages 0 to 5. While the content of this show is meant to be informative, it is not meant to replace the guidance of your physician, therapist, or pediatrician. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Parent Pod Podcast by Jimboree Play and Music. I'm your host, Adonica Shaw. Throughout the month of August, we're going to be focusing on transformation and what parents can do to transform everything in their child's life, from their diet to their sleep schedule and even their play spaces. That said, today we have invited a wonderful guest all the way from the Northeast. Her name is Mona Stinkle, and she's the founder of Spark Wonder. Now, Mona has completed her master's in early childhood education from Columbia University and or Columbia University Teachers College. She went on to complete an advanced certification in special education from Fordham University. She began her career as a preschool teacher and has taught schools all over New York City. She later went on to become an educational director and preschool program director, where she developed curriculum and trained teachers on the importance of play and parent partnerships. I can go on and on about her accolades and her background, but I definitely want to give her a chance to share a little bit about herself, her company, and her journey with Spark Wonder. Mona, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. And so I know that, again, I've got your bio right in front of me, but I definitely would like for you to tell our guests a little bit more about yourself, your background, and how Spark Wonder came to be. Absolutely. Um, So like you said, I am an early childhood educator, and I started working in preschools a number of years ago, mostly in Manhattan. Um, And through that experience, I realized how much of working with children is really working with families. Um, And that really was the foundation of everything that I did from in the classroom to administration and now at Spark Wonder. So Spark Wonder really started as a product of quarantine. Um, I had families reach out that were struggling with their little ones at home, not sure how to kind of keep them engaged and how to grow and really struggling because they were the ones that are now their educators and parents and entertainers all at once. Um, So really what I do now is I I get to know families and I learn a bit about their values and lifestyles and offer solutions, whether it's developmental issues that they're concerned about, behavioral stuff, or just regular routine challenges that are happening as a product of being cooped up at home for almost five months now. Um, And what I do is really personal. It's based on each family, each child, each need, each want, and what goals every parent has for their kids. Now, one of the things I'm very curious about to start, um, when parents come to you and they may say, you know, my child is having behavioral issues or my child, um, you know, has obviously been cooped up in the house for five months, what are usually some of the first things that come to mind for you in terms of how to guide that child back to a place of balance? That's a great question. Um, So whenever I hear that a child is having behavioral issues, what I like to do is kind of have conversations around when is it happening? What is happening? What does that look like? Is it tantrums? Is it just, you know, are they becoming recluse and want to be alone? What does that really look like? Um, And very often you'll hear that it is tantrums. Um, And then even with that, it's really understanding why is a child reacting in that way? There's always a reason. And the reason is never the same for, for any child. So it's really understanding what's going on before the behavior happens. Mm -hmm. Now I can speak purely for myself, you know, I have a three-year-old, but I know that there are many of us that are out there (laughs) across North America listening to this that have young toddlers. And so one of the struggles that I've had, but that I've seen other parents have right now is trying to create like a defined play area somewhere in my house for my child, because honestly, before now my child was in a preschool, you know, all day long, but then when we became quarantined, it's like, okay, I need to create defined areas in the house so that my children know that that is the area for this, or that is the area for learning or for music or for play or for homework. What are some of the ways that parents can go about either defining a space within their home or transforming a space that's already preexistent 
for the child, particularly knowing that they're likely to be in there for at least another few months, so for a long term. I love that you said defining a space because that's really important that a child feels like they have an area that is to themselves and that they can go to. Um, One of the things that I really like to do is kind of keep the less is more mentality. So a lot of families think that they need to have hundreds of toys and hundreds of books and hundreds of things available. And what I often suggest is you can have many things, but keep five or six things out there, especially if you're dealing with the age of three, th- around three-year-olds. Um, keep a few books, keep a few manipulatives, have an open area that um, lends itself to some artwork, uh, whether that's painting or drawing or stickers or whatever, um, and then have a little bit of a building area. And what I always suggest also is alternating some of the stuff. So swap out the books after a couple of days, but allow them to really kind of get into it and don't feel that you need to have this thing that's engaging every second. Let them kind of get into it. It doesn't need to be new all the time. Um, repetition is great. So bring back those same toys that you had out on Tuesday, bring them back out on Friday. Um, and give them a really chan- a chance to really get to understand how to play with these toys. You'll often see children see something once and not really kind of click with it. And families will often disregard it and say that, you know, that's done. They didn't like that toy. But give them the opportunity to, to come around with it again and again. Um, blocks is a huge thing to have. It's very open-ended. It allows children to kind of build from their imagination Um, One of the other things I I talk about often in this kind of space that you're having is to be mindful of the toys that you're putting out there or the things that are available to kids. So what I speak about is open-ended and closed-ended toys a lot. Open-ended toys are like blocks or painting things that can be done and used in multiple multiple ways. And closed-ended tend to be the, the toys that you press a button that sing or light up or have a singular reaction. So the singular reaction toys will kind of keep them engaged for a couple of seconds, maybe a couple of minutes, but it doesn't really engage them to grow and imagine and think outside of the box. Um, And there's so much that you can do with play spaces in general, um, but having a specific space for each kid, and I love that you said designated area, um, is huge because if they know it's their area, they, they're free in there, they can kind of explore and create and have just the zone that allows for endless possibilities. No, thank you for that. I'm like thinking of all of the toys that I have out and I feel like the beginning was like, yes, pull out every single toy because yeah. they will automatically have something to do. And if they get tired with one, then they'll just move to the next one. And yeah. what I ended up with was a mess of toys all over exactly. the place. Exactly. You'll, you'll get a dumping ground, not a playground. Yeah. Um, now, another thing I've noticed just in looking at your website, you have these huge, beautiful, bright colored um, playroom photos. And I know even when I scroll through my Insta feed, for example, a lot of influencers have these like really, really colorful spaces. Yep. Now I could be ignorant, but I remember at some point somebody telling me that if you have like a small child and by small, I'm like um, newborn infant that you're really only sp- supposed to use red, black, and white. Is there a way to go about choosing a color scheme or choosing toys for a space that might be more beneficial than the other, or is it based on age or development, or does that not matter at all? I think it's interesting that you brought up red, I mean, red, black, and white, because I was always under the impression that red is not the best um, color to have. It's actually a very overstimulating color to have in a play space. Um, So I try not to use it too much. Uh, as opposed, and in general, in terms of colors with children, I think it's, it's a personal matter. It's not necessarily scientific and 100% the same for for everyone. There's certain children that are drawn to some colors. There are other children that don't really like other colors. Um, I think generally it's nice to have a bit of color because it is a little bit more engaging and and child-friendly and then be mindful about the things that you have. So I would suggest that if you're doing open-ended toys that those are more neutral, like the block should be neutral colors. Um, It's okay if the shelves have colors, obviously you want the art area to have colors Um, and you don't want it to be overstimulating. So it shouldn't be like 18 different colors, there's murals on the wall, 
the carpets are, are printed, you know, to try to balance it out that if the toys are colorful, that the space is a little bit more neutral. Or if the toys are neutral, then the space can have a little bit more color. Um, because you do want them to get some ideas. I think if it's too sterile, you almost feel like you're in like a hospital room or, or somewhere that's unfriendly and all unwelcoming. Whereas these colors do tend to soften them up and, and make it more inviting for children. Um, often I would suggest, you know, like, lighter colors, pastels, you can have a pop of color here and there. Um, red is definitely not high on my list. I, I found that especially children that, that are overstimulated in general or very active, red tends to energize a little bit more. So that's kind of better for an outdoor area than an indoor area. Um, but colors in general can be a very personal family thing. You don't want a room that's super, super bright and super neon if your whole house is kind of you know, neutral. So you want to balance it out between what you're selecting for the children to play with and what space you have available as well. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of, and I know this is kind of the fun part for me and perhaps other people too, um, when it comes to purchasing things for the playroom, what are your top five essentials that should be in every playroom you know, honestly, I would just go to like Home Goods and be like, oh, I need this. I need this. And like three shopping carts later, I've got all of this stuff. And then I go home and like make it work out. Right. But yeah. I would imagine there's probably like at least five things that every playroom should have by way of essentials. Um, what are they for you? So that's a really great question because a lot of the stuff that I actually pick up is not even from the kids area, to be honest. Um, some of my favorite stuff kind of pertain to some of the open-ended art area um, toys. So they'll be like kitchen sponges and I'll chop them up into smaller pieces and let kids use that. Um, toilet paper rolls are great. I love wine corks. I kind of keep those because those allow for great stamping. They, they also serve as like building pieces sometimes or little people. Those are great and I'm sure they're available in many homes across America these days. Um, just collect what you have. Even uh, a lot of children will have those juice, the squeezy juices. The caps of those are really great. They're colorful. They can be great for sorting. Um, and then generally I like to keep um, neutral color blocks. So you can alternate between foam blocks or some wooden ones if your child's a little bit older and ready to, to use uh, firmer blocks. But those I like to keep a neutral color as well. Wooden are, are perfect. Even the foam ones come in a wooden color. Um, but most of the other stuff I, I kind of collect along the way. They're not necessarily in a designated child area or toy store or even on the Amazon kids section, it's mostly stuff you come across around the house or just through daily experiences. Oh my goodness. Sponges. I was sponges. not expecting you. <laughs> you said sponges. Yes. Like, what, what could you do with sponges? You know? And I'm like, There's in my so head, I'm like, much. you know, I guess you could use them for art projects, right? You can use them for art projects. You can also use them for if you can set up like a little water tub and have babies or dolls or even cars in there um, and have your little one wash them with sponges. That's a really great idea that's open-ended and keeps them engaged, especially in the summertime now. It's, it's so nice. You can even do it outside. Um, there's so much you can do with sponges, so much. Mm -hmm. Now, I like that, you know, there's kind of an educational academic um, use for some of the things that you have um, or that you prioritize for children's spaces. I know some of us right now, and it just, I think, depends on whether or not your child was in preschool prior to quarantine, um, you know, have been looking for ways to help make our, either our living space or the playroom space more homeschool friendly. Um, and I don't know if that means making sure that you've got extra like tracer books in there or more coloring um, materials. Are there any tips that you have that you can impart to our audience on how to also make the play space or whatever designated area in their home more friendly towards homeschooling? Because that certainly seems to be what a lot of us are having to do, whether you have a preschooler or a child that is, you know, 12 and under at least for what the first, the fall semester, or the quarter semester for many people. Um, do you have any recommendations on how they can transform this space to be suitable for that as well? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I love is a visual schedule for little ones. Um, and that can be just like writing it, writing down what the plan is. So breakfast is one schedule piece, lunch, nap time, play time, whatever, in, whatever composes their day um, and having a picture of them next to it. I think that gives them a bit of structure and a school-like feel. Um, and this is great for parents as well because it helps you kind of organize your day and know what's coming up. Um, and children thrive on that. So that's a big takeaway of what happens at school and, and easy to replicate at home. Um, and I think also the second part of making it feel more like school at home is just making sure that the furniture that's available in this play space or play area is really child friendly. And what I mean by that is experience it yourself. So go into that space and sit on the ground and ask yourself, do you feel like a little person in a big world? Or does this feel like a little world just that that's just right for your little child? Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big one because often the spaces are not really conducive to learning because it's a child trying to navigate a big chair or a big desk or a big board. Um, and we want them to feel accessible, that everything's accessible around them. Um, so that's a huge one. And then the third and final one I would say for play spaces to feel like homeschool is just have tons of books and blank pieces of paper. So read, 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 and then allow them to create from what they're reading or what they're hearing. Um, so much of what they talk about will come from books, especially because there isn't so much socialization that's happening now. And you'll see that kind of come together in their creations of art. You'll see those characters kind of come alive um, as an extension of that. So really what, as a teacher, what happens in school is a lot of play-based learning. So it's really just creating a space at home that feels accessible and allows your kid to play. No, I love all of this. Um, do you have any favorite stores where families can very easily pick up some of the items that you've mentioned today? Um, you know, whether they're online or actual brick and mortar stores, I, I recognize that not all brick and mortar stores are open right now, but yeah. do you have a list of stores, maybe three that are your go-tos for parents that they can check out? Um, Michael's is wonderful. And I believe that they're still delivering online. So you can order a bunch of stuff there. They have things that can be used for for multiple purposes and even if you're not sure of like really what you should get just get a couple of things put it in a basket or a box and give it to your little one and they'll create from that um, amazon of course there's everything available at your fingertips and then often a lot of pharmacies i actually pick up a lot of stuff from there uh, q-tips cotton balls those are all great things to have around to play with um, you know a lot of sorting things can happen from if you get colored ones um, so many good things at pharmacy stores. Pharmacy stores. Yeah. I love all of your tips because I'm like, it's just so unexpected because, yes. you know, I'm like sponges, <laughs> pharmacy stores. Yep. <laughs> Got it. You know, you tips uh, are great for painting. Cotton balls are great for sorting egg cartons, all these things you can find there. Yeah. And I'm like, those are the things that I would not let my toddler even near most, most of the time, you know, right. As I'm thinking about it, I do think cotton balls, I would probably see. I'm like, oh, that could be a great art project. But I have boys and I'm like, I could just see them chasing each other around the house, like stabbing each other with the cotton, or not the cotton balls, the um, q -tips. Q -tips. So yeah. <laughs> I tend to keep some of those things up. But as I'm listening to you, I'm like, you know, they do have other uses and it might be uh, a really cool idea to introduce them to them in a way that they can use and manipulate for themselves yeah. as opposed to seeing it purely as something that would be negative. So, And some of it's just modeling, right? If you do it with them or they see you use it for a different purpose, then they'll try it as well. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, I feel like as a, as a mom and I have two older children, but I'm like, my mind always goes to the worst case scenario. Of course. And of that's something I have to transform within myself. And um, I would imagine by doing so over time that I'll also transform my child's perspective on. Of course, um, absolutely. Approach to mute, to not to music, excuse me, but to education and play and learning. And so that's a really good point that you brought up. And I'm like, oh my God, I can totally see myself. Um, maybe approaching this a little differently in my home. And then by way of doing that, it will transform the way that the child uh, sees it and experiences it for themselves. I also really liked your point about um, your child experiencing uh, a little world or a world that's 
uh, specifically for them or them being like a small person in a big person's world where the chairs yeah. are oversized and nothing is really suitable for them. Yeah. So I think that that's another really, really cool point. Now, if our guests wanted to learn more about either your area of expertise or on cultivating and developing play spaces, um, how could they do that? Do you know of any books or do you have any recommendations for what they can study or people online even to follow to get more information? Um, there are so many out there. Um, I think a lot of inspiration from play spaces play spaces, especially from what I do, comes from kind of the Montessori-based um, environment. And even though I add a little bit more color, Montessori is a great place to start with play spaces. Um, and there's tons of stuff. If you just, you know, Google someone, that uh, Google Montessori play spaces, there's a ton out there. There's so many Instagrammers that are doing this as well with their little ones at home and documenting all of it, which is wonderful. Um, but play spaces, I think, are a little bit more individual and, and kind of what you see is, is hard to, to replicate necessarily at your home. So it's kind of just checking out a bunch of people and pulling from different things that you can make work given your space and your lifestyle and your values. No, thank you for that. Um, and then my last question to you, because we're coming to the end of this episode, is how can people get in touch with you if they'd like to utilize your services? Um, I think my website would be ideal. You can find me at www.spark-wonder.com um, and contact information's there. You can schedule something right off the bat. We do free introductory calls just to get to know each other. So all of that's available on the website. Perfect. Um, I just want to, again, thank you so much for being with us on this episode of The Parent Pod. I think that there's obviously so many takeaways from this conversation. And I think that for uh, parents that are listening, whether you're a first time parent or you're a seasoned parent, I think that there's nuggets of information in here that are brand new. So now I know that I can go get sponges. <laughs> I'm not going to let that go. Cause I was like, Oh, she's probably going to say like one of those colorful tents. Cause I think I'm <laughs> for an excuse to buy one of those. Like, okay. Probably a lot easier on my pocket as well. And yeah. more, uh, <laughs> beneficial to my child long-term. So X nay on the tent. But, um, I, I think that there's a lot of really usable information from this conversation and I'm excited to see how parents utilize your advice and um, I'm just excited to bring this information to the Jimbery Play and Music family. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It was great talking to you. Yes. And so for those of you at home that are listening, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of The Parent Pod. If you have any questions or if you have commentary on our conversation, feel free to use the Jimbery Plan Music hashtag on social media. You can mention either one of us. We're going to list all of Mona's background and her information in the description box associated with this particular podcast. And you can reach out to her sound off on social media and i'm sure that she or somebody from our team will respond if you have questions thank you so much for being with us on this episode and we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of the parent pod to learn more about this week's episode or the content discussed in the episode be sure to follow jimboree play and music on facebook